Well, originally I titled this the, the Cold War over the First Amendment, but I thought the Cold War over the Constitution had a nicer ring to it. <laughs> it just rolls off the tongue a little bit better. Um, last week, of course, I talked about the first, I'm sorry, about the 10th Amendment versus the 14th Amendment. And so let, let, let's start here with a little bit of a civics lesson, exactly what the First Amendment says, uh, because again, I wanted to focus on, on some of these First Amendment issues here. So the First Amendment text reads, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for redress of grievances. And as we talked about last week, the 14th Amendment makes this uh, apply to the states. This standard applies to the states because of the, fourth, the, the 14th Amendment. In other words, your governor cannot constitutionally and legally prevent these things, period. Uh, it says that they cannot make no law, all right? And so a, a even though technically an emergency order is not a law, it is a de facto law. It may not be a law de jour, but it is a law in fact, because it is something that people are enforcing, including police officers. Now, when it comes down to this Cold War that's going on, we've already got some sides and some very obvious indications of where people are going. So this is an article from uh, from police1.com. Uh, I, I believe the source material is actually from a local newspaper. I can't see where it's at. But it says, California police now charging, quote, blatant stay-at-home order violators with misdemeanors. Quote, this move towards limited enforcement addresses those that blatantly put the community at risk by engaging in obvious violations of the public health order. So what you have here, this is from uh, Sacramento County. Uh, the various agencies there, including the local police department and all the city police departments, the agencies cited are Sacramento, Elk Grove, Folsom, Citrus Heights, Galt, and the Sacramento County Sheriff's Office, uh, as well as the Sacramento County District Attorney's Office, are basically saying that they're going to start citing more people because they are blatantly violating uh, these orders, these these. Uh, uh, it's, it, actually, they're not even talking about the stay-at-home order per se. They're talking about the shutdown order in terms of people that are having gatherings of more than 10 people. So they, they in this article, they cite specifically a club in, in, uh, that, was, that was cited under, these, uh, under this provision because they were operating illegally. Apparently, it was literally an underground club. It was a club that was underground, and, and they were actually still having uh, parties and things like that, and people were coming in excess of 100 people. So they went ahead and, buy, and did, did some uh, enforcement on them. But this article points out that they're really uh, concerned about house parties. And I said this way, way back when we first talked about uh, the LA mayor's order that basically instigated all these uh, extreme orders. Because was I, I said that was going to be like the first domino falling and everybody was going to fall after that. We read the text of that order and I was completely correct. And we're seeing the same thing now. So what we're seeing here in California is now they're starting to go after the Corona parties. I knew the Corona parties were going to happen. It was only a matter of time. Uh, I, in fact, I, I don't know if I mentioned on this show, but on Easter, we Easter weekend, um, there were some people in my mother's over 55 community having an Easter gathering in the common area, which is outside. They don't have a clubhouse, but it's an outside area and they were having a party. And I joked with my mom, hey, mom, we should call the police. There's over 10 people over there. And then my mom kind of laughed. And then she said, wait a second, do you think we really should? And I said, no, mom, I'm joking with you. But that's what's happening. Uh, and th this is what's happening in California where they are deciding that yes, they're going to enforce these orders. Specifically, you know, they use the extreme example of the literally underground club with a hundred people and they went after them. But then now they're saying, we're gonna go after house parties and uh, let's have the community uh, you know, inform on their neighbors and tell us when these parties are happening. I'll tell you right now, my neighbors can party their ass off if they want to right now. The only issue I would have is if they kept my kids up too late. That's the only issue I would have. And I would deal with that myself and go over there and say, please, can you, can you put the music down? That kind of a thing. All right. I would not be ratting them out because they're having a, a, a party of over 10 people. Um, and I, I don't think there's really even an enforcement mechanism at this point in Arizona to deal with that because under the Arizona order, uh, the right to assemble cannot be infringed. That's specifically exempted in Governor Ducey's order in Arizona. But many of these other governors and also mayors are making stricter orders where they're basically saying, if you have a 
gathering of more than 10 people, we can come in here, we can cite you, we can arrest you, okay? Uh, and, and I have a real problem with that. Now, we're talking about the Cold War that's happening because I have another article from Police One, and this one is an actual Police One article. This is actually made by one of the Police One contributors. Uh, this is Chief Joel F. Schultz, and he was the chief of a small police department, and he is an actual contributor for Police One. He's an actual, uh, I believe, retired officer, and he says, this is his article, and I like this because this is Police One. Police One is looked to by many uh, police administrators and also uh, union people. I mean, it's, it, it's, it's a very uh, well-regarded source of information for actual police officers working, working in the field. And this is his article, and he says, Civil disobedience behind the badge. Can a uniformed officer remain silent and go about a duty that is repugnant to the Constitution? And this is a wonderful article. It says, some years ago, I led an 18-member department in a small town as chief of police. I was ordered by the mayor, my boss by statute, to summarily seize another officer's property. Long story, I will spare you. I advised the mayor that to do so without probable cause or a warrant would be a Fourth Amendment violation that I refuse to be a part of, part of. I was fired for disobeying a direct order. I have always been convinced that no chief should serve without being willing to be fired. Should no police officer serve unless they too are willing to stand between the Constitution and an unlawful order? And again, I really like this because this is someone who was a small town chief of police who actually is uh, making an article for Police One. And he says again, I've always been convinced that no chief should serve without being willing to be fired. In other words, if you want to stand for your convictions, you should be willing to take that hit. And he asks, should no police officer serve unless they too are willing to stand between the Constitution and an unlawful order? And he doesn't necessarily answer the question directly, but he, he's presenting the question uh, to a law enforcement community. Again, this is a very respected source of news uh, in, in, in the law enforcement community. And it, it's, this is a great article. It talks about, you know, the, the situation in these places like, uh, you know, uh, Mississippi and uh, uh, Louisville. Like we have a picture here of uh, Pastor Bruce Shaper as he's preaching uh, from a scissor lift during the first of two drive-in Easter services held by Grace Life Church in a parking lot in, uh, this is Monroeville, uh, Pen Pen uh, Pennsylvania, uh, Sunday, April 12, 2020 because we've had this controversy about these um, drive-in church services. Now in Arizona, our, our executive order specifically exempts religion. So the churches that are not meeting in Arizona are doing so voluntarily. They, are, they have, have agreed not to meet because they have said that it's a public health concern and they've agreed not to meet. And that's the case of most churches in Arizona. In some other states, they have closed the churches. The executive order specifically bans all gatherings of basically over 10 people and therefore has banned church services. So then you have these people that are trying to be creative and they're having these drive-in church services where they're either using a PA or they're using a little FM transmitter uh, to have the service. And what's happened is you've had cities and states try to step up and basically try to break up these church gatherings completely illegally uh, completely against the Constitution, completely against the, the First Amendment. Um, and this is a lot of what this article is about. Uh, and this is, a, again, a former chief of police of a small town that's basically asking uh, officers to question themselves in what they, being involved in this kind of enforcement. Uh, I know in the, in the case of, of Louisville, there is an active um, lawsuit going on uh, because the, basically the, the officers were out there taking people's license plates that were showing up for these uh, these drive-in uh, church services. Uh, so theoretically, at least what they said was, so that if they get sick, we can contact trace them later. And, and come on, everybody, we know that that's a bunch of bull. We we know what what, what was going on there. Okay, they're 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 keeping their eyes on these people. And and the way that law enforcement works is, you don't want to go after a hundred people at the same time. You, you want to take them down one by one. I mean, that's just basic, that's just a basic tactic of, of law enforcement. You don't want to be outnumbered. 
Uh, that's that, that's just idiocy, right? And these people now, aren't idiots. Are they, are they uh, taking out this dangerous gang of churchgoers uh, using the RICO Act? Because it seems like maybe they need to bring in the big guns here. <laughs> You know, I, I don't know that did that did not come up in my in my uh, in my research. <laughs> but this this uh, particular article says, you know, is is this, you know an example? I I am experiencing as I write this is a prohibition on a, a drive-in service for the church right the church I attend during the COVID nineteen pandemic. Our governor specifically endorsed drive-in services, but gave latitude to local health agencies to alter the regulations. Says our regional health department said no drive-in services for the church after two requests with no further avenue of appeal. The department is staffed by persons hired by a board of health who in turn are appointed by the board of county commissioners. The public health order prohibits specifically all church events other than electronic delivery. That same order allows, that same order allows marijuana curbside checkup or pickup, mar marijuana curbside pickup, restaurant drive-up service, and I can still walk into my local coffee shop to get a cup of, of coffee to go. Think about that. Yeah, and this no, is what I'm hearing all over the place. So yeah, no, your church question is, yeah, if, if you, okay, so you can pick up marijuana, you can pick up coffee, but, but churches are just too dangerous. Now, what if you have your Native American temple and you have curbside peyote pickup? Is, is that dangerous because it's religious or is it allowed because it's a drug pickup? <laughs> that's the question, right? And it's kind yeah. of funny. It is 420 day, right? It is 420 today. So this is this is kind of a little acknowledgement to that. But but, but what you this know shows what I mean, sorry, I, I think it's what you're getting at. What this really shows is that these policies are completely disconnected from the ostensible results. If you know all these things are safe to do, but going to church in your car when you're not breathing on anybody, you're not endangering anybody. They're still trying to arrest people. They've completely lost sight of what they're doing. Why are they putting these regulations in place if they're not even going to think about the consequences? Exactly. And the article goes on to say, frankly, since I know of no scientific evidence that COVID-19 would be leaping from car to car in our church parking lot while drivers listen on the FM radio short range transmission, the order is in violation of both the freedom of peaceable, assemb peaceable assembly and the free exercise of religion and lacks the means to petition for the redress of grievances. In other words, there's no appeal to this. That's what he's saying in his own community. Wow. Up here. Wow. I so, didn't read that part. That guy was way ahead of me. I had a whole riff I was going to say about that. Please keep going. It says, here's my hypothetical. If I, was, if I were still in uniform and were ordered to cite or arrest a church leader or a tender, at a quote, unauthorized drive-in church service, what would I do? Keeping in mind that the most often heard yet most impotent defense at the Nuremberg trials was, quote, I was only following orders. And I love this man because this is, again, a former police chief of a small town. He is writing on an outlet that is, is widely looked at by uh, police officers, including chiefs of police, sheriffs, it's a, it's a very respected news, source, uh, news service in the law enforcement community. And he is asking an excellent question that is being asked on a lot of forums right now within the, la the law enforcement community because a lot of people don't like this and they are very angry about this. And these are people with tactical training. These are people that have experience. And this is why I say this is a cold war that we are starting to experience. The longer this goes, the more officers retired and current are going to be questioning these orders and saying, no, we're not going to do this. And it's going to come to a head. Uh, citizens already, uh, even in my state right now, which I think we have one of the most reasonable shelter in place orders in the country in Arizona. Uh, right now, there are citizens protesting at the state capitol as we speak right now. And so uh, this is just going to get worse the longer that these orders are in effect and more and more officers are going to have to ask themselves this hard question. I can tell you there are officers right now that are saying, I, I will not comply. I will not enforce this kind of an order. And of course, there are lots of officers that will. And that's, again, why I'm saying this is a cold war over the Constitution. 
uh, and we could see it become a hot war if we are not careful and if these boneheaded, boneheaded governors, boneheaded mayors, uh, bo boneheaded county board of supervisors don't step up and realize they are overstepping and don't and start don't start real stop realizing that they their agenda is clear their agenda is clear he he gave us a, a a very micro example of what was going on in his own community where church events are banned but they can still get their marijuana they can still do the restaurant drive through they can still walk into a coffee shop and get a cup of coffee to go yeah there, there's no agenda there right nothing to see folks nothing to see um but but I, again i really commend uh this gentleman, uh, I'll give out his name again, Chief Joel F. Schultz. Uh, and there's a picture of him uh, on the article as well. Uh, this man is, is a hero in my, my mind, and he is asking some very hard questions in a forum that is respected within the law enforcement community. And many officers have to be asking themselves, what would they do in his hypothetical scenario? They have to be yeah. asking themselves that right now. Absolutely. And the thing that I thought was the most amazing uh, part of, of that article that you just shared, because we started this by looking at the First Amendment, and it has that, that fantastic clause about the redress of grievances, which we never talk about anymore, because we have no mechanism for the, the redress or redress of, of grievances in American political, uh, under our, our, our Constitution. As a practical matter, that doesn't really exist. The only mechanism we have is Congress, but that makes that redundant because it already says Congress shall make no law. So well, Congress is isn't doing anything right now. That's the other thing. Going back to, to, to Macy's point, right, because I think we're pretty big defenders of, of, of Congressman Macy. You know, he's asking them to meet to do their job and they're hiding and they don't yeah. want to do their job and they don't want to legislate anymore. And the same thing is happening in, in every state legislature across the country right now. They're scared. They're hiding under their desks, right? Uh, well, not their desks. They're, they're, they're hiding under their beds because they're at home. They're not, they're not in their offices, right? Their offices are closed. So how do you even uh, protest this uh, in a reasonable way other than what they're doing right now, where they're just marching or doing drive-ins or something like that? People make fun of them. But what else are they supposed to do? They can't go to their local city council meeting because they don't happen anymore. They can't go to their local uh, legislative meeting because that doesn't happen anymore. There's no right. oversight. Yeah, you know? we shut down the legislative bodies at the time when we need them most. And we have the ability to make these remote, to make these virtual. Congress voted, they discussed at least, whether or not they would start holding sessions of Congress virtually. So that way they don't have to be all in the same place. And they decided no. How can you decide no? When right now we're, we're saying we're worried about the coronavirus pandemic. Everybody should work from home. But, oh, Congress, people from all over the country should fly to Washington. We've already had members of Congress infected. Of course they're going to be infected. If, if they're flying from all over the country to Washington and then they're all shaking hands and hanging out together, how are they not going to infect each other all the time? This is absolutely insane. And, and it gets oh, this is, what, this is all about power. This is all about power and putting it into as few hands as possible. That's what we're seeing right now. Yes. Now, I did want to. I did want to mention. The, okay. I, I did want to mention this. 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 A little bit more. I don't know if it's on the hopeful side because obviously there's a content, a conflict here. But the Kentucky Attorney General says, "quote Churches must be allowed to hold drive-in services." Kentucky has been like like uh, ground, you know, ground zero for a lot of the the coverage over this issue. And it says Kentucky Attorney General Daniel uh, Cameron announced Saturday that he filed an abacus brief in support of a Louisville church's federal lawsuit against the city over its right to hold drive-in services during the COVID-19 pandemic. So what you have here is both the governor and the mayor have basically come against this church in, in different ways with, with, with their various orders. Now the attorney general is basically saying he's going to take up the plight of this church and he is going to file a lawsuit uh, in federal court to basically stop the harassment that's going on at this church. And I'm going to tell you, this is completely on partisan lines. Uh, Cameron is a, is a Republican. The governor of the state is a Democrat and the mayor of the city is a Democrat. Um, and again, this is part of what's happening with our cold war over the constitution right now. 
And what you're seeing is, which, which I think is funny, you know, the only reason I'm registered as a Republican is because I, I agree with the platform more than I agree with the Democratic platform. It's not because I think Republicans in general are better than Democrats. I don't. I think exactly the opposite. But I'm telling you right now, you are seeing a definite difference between Republicans and Democrats in this crisis from the president all the way down. Whether you, you know, here in Arizona, all of our usual suspects, uh, the, the most liberal, most progressive cities, uh, Flagstaff, uh, Phoenix, Tucson. Tucson has a has an online page where you can rat out your neighbors if they're having parties. It's disgusting. It's disgusting. And and, and I have to say, for, for any of our, our libertarian listeners or viewers or whatever, there is a difference. There is a definite difference between what the Republicans are doing right now, all the way from the president, all the way down. The president could have issued martial law anytime he wanted to. They, they, de Blasio begged him to. He wanted troops in the street of New York so he could enforce his uh, curfews because that's how out of out of his mind he is. OK, so make no mistake. There is a difference and we're seeing it. There is an absolute difference. I wanted to. Uh, yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. And I wanted to talk about, you know, this is why Trump got elected. Right. He got elected because people were sick of business as usual from the politicians. And what that police chief said about redress of grievances, that's why we have legislation. It's so that when people are upset, when people are unhappy, there's a there's a mechanism for us to make decisions to rectify things. But right now we have people making policy who are completely out of touch with what their constituents want. They don't even care what their constituents want. They want to put tanks on the streets. How is that Republican? How is that Democratic? How is that in any way keeping with the spirit of the American Constitution and, and who we are as a people? Now, there's a lot well, of things. I've always tried to say, Pete, I've always tried to say that, that a lot of the, the right-left paradigm is totally incorrect. It has nothing to do with right and left. We say, you know, Republicans are more right, Democrats are more left. It really has nothing to do with that. It's a matter of whether you're into freedom or you're into tyranny. That's the only sliding scale. There's no difference in practical terms between a far right fascist and a far left communist. There's no difference in practical terms between the two of them. It's just a matter of ideology. But in practical terms, the average person is still going to be just as oppressed and just as, as, as not involved in the political system. And it, and it becomes a, a system of elitists, right? There's, there's, no, oh, difference. there's no difference. Absolutely. Yeah, they both want an elite to govern. Now, I don't know if you know this. We talked about Governor or a mayor, Bill de Blasio. Did you know that the New York City Council is the same size today that it was 120 years ago? No, I did so, not know that. Yeah. So obviously New York is, is much larger. I don't know how many people live in New York City or are governed by the New York City Council, but it's something like 20 million people. And yet the city council hasn't gotten bigger. And that's by design. If you go back and you read the progressive manifestos from the beginning of the 20th century, they wanted city councils to be smaller, not larger. They wanted city councilmen to be more elite, not closer to the people. So that way they could make decisions without being accountable to the voters. This isn't an act. It's by design. It's not even a conspiracy because conspiracy suggests that this was done in secret or that these discussions happen in secret, that this wasn't just laid out on the table as this is the way we want to do it. This is what they laid out on the table. This is how they want to do it. And they, you know, if you look at any city, even like here in Arizona, in Arizona where you have uh, cities are run, ostensibly we have a city council, typically our city councils are very small to the number of citizens. Um, and the cities are run by bureaucrats. City councils have very little power over what goes on. And so, yeah, the mayor can make an emergency declaration. He can act unilaterally, but he also has to get a permission slip from the town manager. And then you have the town attorney that tells you a lot of stuff that what you can do and what you can't do. Well, well and actually, uh, Pete, Pete, I do have a little bit of insight into this because I've actually read some of these city charters. And in the West, typically, mayors have a lot less power than they do on the East Coast. For instance, yes. the, the mayor of New York, de Blasio, really is like his own little governor. I mean, he, he has an immense amount of power because he has a huge infrastructure, but one of the largest police forces in the world at his disposal, okay? So it's a different situation over there. But traditionally on the West Coast, uh, we have what they call, you know, the city manager council system. So the mayor is actually, tip, is, is, is usually very weak. 
The mayor in, in most uh, West Coast cities is very weak. The city manager runs the city, except, except Pete, in an emergency declaration, because mayors are elected. Therefore, they get power when they start making emergency declarations, because as an unelected official, the city manager doesn't have that authority. So do you see what I'm trying to say here? There's a motivation I, behind why these mayors are doing what they're doing, because now they get to run the show. Now, we have a, a, a mutual friend, Marissa Hamilton, who has been very tough on Phoenix Mayor Kate Gallego, and with good reason. She's absolutely right. So uh, I understand that the mayor has more power, but aren't there still a lot of ways for the staff to undercut and undermine the mayor, even in a time of no, a, no, an emergency of course declaration? There is, because that's because that's the way that these places are run, especially on the West Coast. Again, most most major West Coast cities have a, a, a manager council style of government. That's the style of, of, of city management they have. New York doesn't have that. In New York, the mayor is the chief executive. He makes the decisions and everybody, all those commissioners are under him. But in, right. in a, most West Coast cities, the city manager runs the city. And it, the mayor basically just runs the city council meeting as there for ceremonial duties again, except when it comes to emergency declarations, because as an unelected official, the city manager does not have that authority. So I believe that there's a conflict of interest here in terms of these mayors that are becoming little dictators. They're like, well, now's my time to shine. Now I can actually do something because we're in a crisis and I can make these declarations because an emergency, uh, basically because an emergency has been declared in my state. That's the way it works. We're talking about things with FEMA and federalism and all that kind of stuff. FEMA is not going to listen to the city manager. They don't give a crap what he says because that's not their, their procedure. They need to talk to an elected official. You see what I'm saying? That's right. the way these things work. So this is their time to basically become these little dictators and do whatever they want because now they can. Emergency declarations allow them to do so. Now, at the time that our country was founded, a congressman, a member of the U.S. Congress, represented between 10 and 30,000 uh, constituents. Today, if you are the mayor of a town of a million people, you respond to a million constituents. And a lot of times your city council is elected at large or they, they govern very large districts, which means that most people don't feel very connected to their city government. They don't know who the mayor is. So if he's making a, an emergency declaration and seizing all this power, I mean, I guess I'd rather he have it than the town manager because at least the, the town manager is is appointed and nobody knows who that guy is. You know, he, he can go completely off the, the reservation, off the rails, and nobody would even know. That's insane. That's ridiculous. But the, the point is, our city people don't know who the city government is because it doesn't matter because they're they're the city governments aren't allowed to make very many decisions in many places you don't have home rule in Arizona you do have home rule so cities can be fairly strong but you do, you're not even very connected to your mayor and and I think this is a big part of the problem that people are calling for we've we've talked about a lot of things over this hour but one of the things was people are calling for reopening the economy we don't want to wear masks well, you know, with rights come responsibility. With authority comes responsibility. I, I wish more people would take an active role in city government. Understand what your city is doing, because if you don't, you don't get to complain later. And and you're not going to see those trade-offs. You know, you can make irresponsible demands. Like, I don't want to wear a mask. You know, it makes me feel nerdy to wear a mask, so I'm not going to wear one in public. Well, <laughs> you, sh you should. And if you were responsible for the consequences of your actions, maybe you'd be more in the habit of thinking about it that way. But but right now we have these dumb political debates between people who want to have no responsibility and people who want to have no liberty. And it has to be both. If we're going to have a free society, we're going to have to wear masks. We're going to have to think about the common. No, this, is, this is the essence of liberty. You know, I, I heard a definition uh, years ago where somebody was talking about the difference between liberty and anarchy. And, and, and we used to have these debates all the time and with the Ron Paul campaign because there were anarchists involved in the Ron Paul campaign. I met them. I talked to them, which I always thought was ironic. It's like, you're an anarchist. Why are you involved in this political movement? <laughs> it's not very anarchist of you. But, but he appealed to that, those kind of people. And I remember having debates with, with people like that. 
And the difference between liberty and anarchy is very is very uh, simple to me. It, it's the idea that in in liberty you have freedom and responsibility, and that in our anarchy you don't. There is no responsibility, and that's a you know the the whole mask issue is is a great example of that. Um, just wear a mask. Do it voluntarily. In Arizona, you don't have to. You don't have to wear one here, but but sure. do it anyway. You know, and, um, it, it's something that, that is courteous to your neighbors. Right. And there was one other thing before we sign off here that I thought that that quotation from the article was so great. It says, no chief should serve without willing to be fired. You know, these people are not accountable. These mayors, these councilmen, these congressmen, they feel safe because they know nobody's going to run against them. Nobody even knows what they do. You know, how do we have a, how do we, I think it's difficult when you have a police department, but how do we have a sensible framework to hold our, our police accountable the way we want to hold Congress and other government agencies accountable? Well, that's, again, goes back to your argument of why you need to know your city officials, because they're the ones that are responsible for hiring and firing your police chief. But right now, I, I'm not seeing the problem with the police chief. I'm seeing the problems with the mayors and the governors who are doing these unconstitutional orders. And it, it comes oh, down absolutely. to police chiefs deciding whether they're going to go along with this or not. And ultimately, it comes down to the individual officer deciding whether they're going to go along with this or not. Again, I'm, I'm just happy I live in Arizona, where at least freedom of religion and assembly have not been infringed. And that's right. specific in the order. And I know a lot of officers in my state that are very happy about that because they don't even have to get involved in that debate. Yeah. And I think this police chief was trying to set the example by making that statement. Not that he fears for his job, but he's saying, hey, I'm willing to step down if the people don't think I'm doing a, a good job. And he's 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 reminding everybody who they work for, which I think is is very noble. Which ultimately is the people. It's not the mayor. It's not the city council. Ultimately, you work for the people. And, and every police officer, as far as I know, in the entire country, uh, they take an oath to the Constitution, not to their mayor, not to their governor, not to their, uh, not even to the president. There's no loyalty oaths. You don't do that. Uh, you take your oath to the Constitution and to the Constitution of your own state. Right. And that's it. Yeah. Yeah, and until we until people feel like government is really accountable to them, we're going to see a lot more out, out of the box candidates, out of the box type of candidates, people like Trump, because the people of America are fed up. This is why Trump was elected, because people felt that government doesn't work. It doesn't listen to them. Problems don't get solved. Absolutely.